across America. Live, this is Point of View. And now, Kirby Anderson. Thank you for joining me. We're going to spend some time today talking about origins, a topic that we've come back to from time to time. And in some ways, this is really a foundational issue that we'll be discussing today. If you go back uh, more than 150 years when Charles Darwin wrote his book, Origin of Species, 1859, uh, there were a few things that were of concern to him. One in particular is oftentimes referred to as the Cambrian Explosion of Life. I think he held out to the idea that eventually we, through paleontological research, would be able to find some of those missing fossils. He was aware of the fact that a lot of the missing links were missing, and the explosion of life on this uh, particular geological realm was certainly one challenge to his faith, if you will, and certainly a challenge to his theory of evolution. Even 36 years ago when I wrote a book on paleontology, we were talking about the fact that uh, paleontology really hadn't uh, answered those questions. If anything, it made it more difficult. But now, of course, we know even more than we knew certainly 150-plus years ago. And it's well documented in this new book by Dr. Stephen Meyer, Darwin's Doubt, The Explosive Origin of Animal Life and the Case for Intelligent Design. You may be familiar with Stephen Meyer. He's been on the program with us before. He's the director of the Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture. He certainly has been very much involved in promulgating the idea of intelligent design, not only through some of his books, perhaps the best known up until now has been the book Signature in the Cell, DNA and the Evidence for Intelligent Design. Just as he looked at that question of the origin of life, now he looks at the origin of this what many people call evolution's Big Bang or origin's Big Bang. And so we're going to spend some time talking with him. He has a Ph.D. from Cambridge University and joins us now by phone. Stephen, thank you for joining us today here on Point of View. Kirby, thanks for having me back with you. Well, we certainly appreciate the good work that you have done over the years, and uh, we certainly think that this is a conversation today that, even though it'll be slightly technical, I think everybody can follow it very well, and you start off by looking at certainly the Cambrian explosion, but then use that to go back into some things that you have written about before in other venues on biology, certainly biochemistry, genetics, uh, probability, and the rest. But I think it's good to start off by saying that uh, Charles Darwin was the first to admit, even in Origin of Species, that this explosion of life at this level known as the Cambrian was certainly a challenge to what he expected. He expected it to look like a tree where you go back to a single cell and you would have finely graduated uh, various transitional fossils along the way that would show where all of these creatures came from. But instead, they just show up abundantly and abruptly, don't they? Absolutely. You said that very well. uh, In fact, uh, a non-technical way of getting a handle on the problem is just to contrast that picture of the tree, which Darwin used to depict his understanding of the history of life, with the picture that you would derive from an analysis of the fossil record, which looks more like a, a lawn, or maybe an orchard of separate trees where none of the individual trees connect to each other. And, and so you have this contrast between the, a picture of gradual evolutionary change taking a great deal of time and a much more abrupt appearance of the major forms of animal life. And as, as you uh, uh, explained very eloquently in your opener, this was something that Darwin was aware of. It caused him some... Uh, uh, concern about his theory. Uh, it was a, a doubt that he had, and that's what I address in the book. As I, I tell, I look at Darwin's doubt, and then I tell the story of what's become of it and how that doubt has has intensified over the 150 years since Darwin. In part because the missing fossils in the lower Precambrian layers of sedimentary strata uh, have not materialized and have not been found. And secondly, because of all the things we've learned about what's inside life, the digital code that's stored in the DNA molecule and the circuitry that is necessary to help uh, organize and differentiate different types of cells as they um, are forming uh, whole animal body plants during the process of development from embryo to adult, uh, adult form. 
some of the things that I discovered just doing the research in this book about developmental biology were just mind-blowing to me. Um, the immense complexity of the interrelated, essentially it's an integrated circuitry that's controlling the way cells develop over time. So there's the mystery of the missing fossils, but there's also the deeper engineering mystery of how do you build something as complex as these functionally integrated animal forms that arise so suddenly in the Cambrian period. I might just mention that uh, the book begins with geology, obviously, but then you end up back into biology to explain some of that, and it's very similar to the book that you wrote, uh, or at least published four years ago, A Signature in the Cell, where you talked about this idea of an information revolution. We understand right now that we have been enjoying an information revolution. Just look at our cell phones that we have, look at the computers that we use. But there was, in a sense, an information revolution that was necessary, as you talk about in your previous book, if indeed evolution is true, that put all that information in a meaningful way. But then, let's move on to the book that you have today. You begin to talk about all the things, as you said, that have to happen internally, uh, the sequence of amino acids, the various kinds of structures and things of that nature. And this has caused a much greater problem. And as Paul Nelson has said on this program before, you quote him in the book as well, if you could somehow bring a Charles Darwin to the 21st century, uh, he would see there were some other really major problems with his theory. And one of those is biology. We now know how much more complex life is we now have been able to open up uh, Darwin's black box, the cell, and find out that there's a level of complexity that is hard to explain, not only when you look at the origin of life, your previous book, but even this explosion of all these uh, particular creatures that show up ab abruptly right there in the fossil record. Absolutely. He'd have some head scratching to do. I think there would be more than one doubt now. But uh, I used to ask my students when I was uh, teaching um, college kids, uh, you want to give your your computer a new function. What do you have to, to give it? What do you have to provide to it? And they, being more techie than I am, would say, well, code or a program or software, and all of those were uh, instructions. All of those were correct answers. Well, the great discovery of the last 60 years of biology is that the same thing is true of life. If you want to build life in the first place, you want to build the first simple living cell, which was what my first book was about, the evolutionary process has to provide information. It has to provide digital code and DNA necessary to build the proteins and protein machines that are necessary to keep a single one-celled organism alive. But the same thing turns out to be true if you, if you want to build uh, whole new animal forms. When the Cambrian animals come into the fossil record, they manifest distinctive new structures. Trilobites, one of my favorite forms, I was fascinated with them when I was a little kid, uh, have these exquisite compound eyes. Um, there are fish now in the Cambrian, and we know that fish have gills and swim bladders and all kinds of interesting organs. Well, every new organ and tissue in, a, in an animal requires specific types of cells, and each cell type in turn requires dedicated kinds of proteins. So a gut cell, for example, requires digestive enzymes. Enzymes are proteins. And we know that proteins are built from the instructions set encoded in DNA. Let me jump in real quickly. We'll continue our conversation with Dr. Stephen Meyer. So we talk about his new book, Darwin's Doubt. More of that coming up right after this. Life is a wild ride, but even that couldn't prepare you for this. You're on your ninth wild ride, the Carnival Twist and Whirl, your granddaughter's wishes trumping your amusement park fears. And it's here, healthy enough to feel the joy over the terror that the question hits you. How did I get here? Was it just hard work or smart choices? Like choosing Rite Aid and exclusive benefits for seniors with Rite Aid's new Wellness 65 Plus program. You get free pharmacist consultations that include medication reviews, blood pressure screenings, and immunization checklists. Wellness 65 Plus also gives you points for every prescription, even Medicare, that earn you up to 20% off your Rite Aid purchases fast. All meant to keep you here. Now that you've actually gotten here, here. Being the best and bravest grandma in the whole wide world. Stop by and enroll free in Wellness 65 Plus at Rite Aid today. With us, it's personal. 
Certain limitations apply. See your Rite Aid store or riteaid.com for details. Today in America, people wake up worrying about their job and paying their bills, and that stinks. People in third world countries wake up worrying if their children will have anything to eat, and that stinks even worse. There's a way to help solve both of those problems. Get on the internet and go to usagoodness.com and find out how you can be a social entrepreneur. Hi, how in the world are you anyway? I'm Andy Willoughby, and for years I have been helping people work from home. With usagoodness.com, you can earn extra money working from home by helping to feed starving children in poverty-stricken areas. How great is that? The only tools you'll need are a telephone, internet access, and a good work ethic. We'll teach you how to be a social entrepreneur and earn extra money while helping others. Go to usagoodness.com or call 800-301-6177. 800-301-6177. We joined MediShare back when I lost my job that provided family health coverage. We really liked the biblical approach of Christians sharing each other's medical bills, not to mention the cost savings. Last year, I was diagnosed with cancer, just a year after it took my dad. Needless to say, I was scared. I was so thankful for the way MediShare guided me through every step, choosing treatment, finding a doctor, and its members sharing all my medical bills. Over $72,000 so far. We would have had to sell our home. For us, MediShare has been a godsend. Learn how you could save on your health care. For your MediShare information guide, call 866-89-BIBLE. Not available in Montana. MediShare, affordable biblical health care. Call 866-89-BIBLE. That's 866-89-BIBLE. You're listening to Point of View, your listener-supported source for truth. Topic of Origins is our topic today, and if you'd like to join our conversation a little bit later, we'll open up the phones as we talk today with Dr. Stephen Meyer. His book is entitled Darwin's Doubt, The Explosive Origin of Animal Life and the Case for Intelligent Design. We also uh, certainly would uh, commend to you the earlier book, Signature in the Cell, DNA, and the Evidence for Intelligent Design. You can find both books in your local bookstore, but we also have a link to our website, which allows you to order the book. We also have a link to Stephen Meyer's website so that you can find out more about him, watch the video, and, of course, learn more about uh, an excellent organization that I would also encourage you to support, as I do, and that is the Discovery Institute. Let's, if we can, for just a minute, Steve, uh, since you and I are good enough friends, uh, let me take the other side and say, okay, here's how evolutionists would explain that. The argument that we sometimes got from everybody from Charles Darwin on until fairly recently, and in your book you explain why, was, well, we just didn't have very good fossils. These were simple cell organisms. There weren't, maybe they had a lot of soft parts. So what to you looks like an abrupt explosion of life actually was a long, tedious process of evolution. It just doesn't show up on the fossil record. How yeah, do you respond? Ter- a terrific uh, statement of one of the main counter-arguments, and it uh, usually goes under the heading of the artifact hypothesis. The idea is that the ancestral fossils in the Precambrian strata that we would expect to find based on a Darwinian view aren't there beca- as, uh, because uh, of incomplete sampling or incomplete preservation. It's the, the missing fossils are said to be an artifact of incomplete preservation or sampling. Um, and there have been various versions of that idea, and one by one they've kind of fallen by the way. The most persuasive uh, uh, way of formulating that was to say exactly as you did, that the, the, the animals weren't preserved because the, pre- the ancestral animals weren't preserved because they were either too soft or too small to be preserved by the depositional environments in the Precambrian. A major find in China in the 1980s and 90s has put that idea also to rest. Um, there, the, the fossils discovered were in a place near Chengjiang in southern China, and it was a major Cambrian find, an exquisitely preserved Cambrian animals. The first fishes are now documented to, to be in existence from the Cambrian. But in a layer beneath the Cambrian layers that document the explosion in China, there have been found small microscopic embryo fossils 
And moreover, these embryos are probably of sponges. And so we have soft-tissued microscopic fossils preserved in the Precambrian layers just beneath the explosion. But the ancestral forms to all the major groups of animals that are currently lacking uh, uh, ancestral uh, precursors were not discovered. No, no, no ancestors to trilobites or fishes or echinoderms or any of the other groups. And so th- th- that raised a huge question. If you can preserve an embryo, if you can preserve soft microscopic tissue, why weren't the ancestral forms of those uh, uh, of the uh, the larger uh, animals that would have had to have at least some hard parts preserved in the, that lower sediment in those lower Precambrian sedimentary layers, and so m- many of the Chinese uh, paleontologists are now deeply skeptical about this artifact hypothesis. And I would say most Cambrian authorities would now affirm that the Cambrian explosion is a real event, not an artifact of bad sampling or preservation. You know, and I might say that uh, some of that comes from your third chapter there, where you talk about uh, the paleontologist J. Y. Chen. And I know that you even in uh, Seattle had him come and speak to the geology department at the University of Washington. And so you've got some very prominent paleontologists, in this case uh, an individual that lives in China, really challenging with good fossil evidence one of the theories that has been around for really decades. Well, when, when Chen was here in Seattle, he made a very memorable comment. He, he said that the yes. Ambrian fossils turned Darwin's tree of life upside down. And he took his hand with his fingers pointing upward in the, manner, in the, the pattern of a tree and just turned it upside down with the fingers all pointing downward. To show to show the the basic problem, the the basic divisions of life and the, the the big changes in the history of life occur very suddenly. And right from the beginning, you have this uh, what they call morphological disparity, big uh, differences in body plan arising very suddenly. Well, and I also have to use the other famous quote, which I know you know. J. Y. Chen was asked about uh, the fact that he's very critical of evolution, and being in China, he said, "Well, in China, we can criticize Darwin, but not the government." But in America, you can criticize the government, but not Darwin. And I thought that was a powerful quote because it illustrates, again, what has become kind of an icon of the scientific endeavor, that any time you criticize uh, the theory of evolution, you're going to have people level all sorts of charges, even if you're not a person who believes in intelligent design as you do, because it's almost like that is uh, one of the sacred cows today on the university campus. And I'm telling somebody who lives in Seattle, so you know that only so well. Well, uh, he, he said that at the University of Washington with something of a wry smile, um, <laughs> indicating uh, his subtext was, so whose, whose country is more free, really? You know, yeah. I know, I know about your American universities and their political correctness. Um, one, one of the themes that I strike in the book is that of uh, contrasting the public pronouncements that are made on behalf of contemporary evolutionary theory by spokesmen for the, the theory like Richard Dawkins or Eugenie Scott at the National Center for Science Education or Bill Nye, the science guy, or any of the major science organizations, uh, each of which deny that there is anything controversial about evolutionary theory. And the depiction of the theory as you find it in the peer-reviewed scientific literature, where there are very formidable challenges uh, being raised to, in particular, the creative power of the mutation natural selection mechanism. One scientist has said um, rather you know, succinctly, uh, puts it this way, he says that uh, the natural selection explains the survival but not the arrival of the fittest. It explains mm-hmm. the small-scale adaptations, but not the big events in the history of life, such as, for example, the Cambrian explosion of animals. So again, survival, not arrival. I love that turn of phrase. And You know, we've had Paul Nelson on this program before. You quote from him in the book, and he said, you know, let's, uh, let's give Charles Darwin his due. Uh, a 19th-century scientist, he discovered or at least uh, promoted the idea of natural selection. We uh, recognize that. I don't care if you're a creationist, evolutionist. Don't believe if you believe in theistic evolution or intelligent design. Everybody re- recognizes that natural selection is phenomenon, and that, as you said, explains survival, but it doesn't explain arrival. And that's really what your last two books have been focusing on, one on the origin of life in your book, Signature of the Cell, and then this one, Darwin's Doubt, the abrupt appearance of all sorts of life forms in the Cambrian. And I think in both cases, we are dealing with a 
theory that was a good theory in part in the 19th century to explain something, but we just know a whole lot more about geology, biochemistry, genetics uh, than we did in the 18th century. And it's maybe time that uh, in the 18th and 19th century, those theories worked okay, but we're in the 21st century now. We need to update that. And that, I think, is really kind of the theme that runs all the way through your book. Absolutely, and uh, we're in an information age. Darwin knew nothing about either the genetic information or what we now call epigenetic information. There are other forms of information in living cells that are not stored in DNA, and that poses a major problem to the theory because you could mutate DNA indefinitely, and you would never build a new animal body plan because other forms of information are necessary to build such plans, And yet, the neo-Darwinian idea is that the mutations in DNA provide the source of all new innovation. And so that's just one of many problems. I look at five separate problems with the idea that natural selection is a creative process, drawing on some of the really cutting-edge work that Paul Nelson has done. Well, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to continue our conversation with Stephen Meyer. Uh, The first section deals with the mystery of missing fossils. There's so much more we could focus on, but we're going to move on to the section on how to build an animal after Darwin what, and in particular, we'll get into some aspects of biology, in particular genetics and biochemistry and information theory, and give you an understanding of some of the other aspects of this book. First of all, let me mention that we have on our articles section here a kind of a summary of the book. It's really an excerpt from Darwin's Doubt, so you can read a little bit about that. So go to the articles section. If you go to the web link, that will take you to Stephen Meyer's website in case you want to communicate with him, watch one of the videos, or uh, find out more information about the Discovery Institute. And if you go to our POV store, first of all, we're offering the book. Of course, you can find it in your local bookstore, and I, if you can do so, I would encourage you to do so. It is about almost 500 pages, and it is published by Harper. But again, if you would like to order it, we have it available on our website, pointofview.net. And we'll also make available a little bit later, I'm going to talk about a DVD that has been out for some time by Illustra Media, Darwin's Dilemma. Stephen Meyer is in there along with a number of other people we've just mentioned, and we will come back and give you a chance to uh, ask some questions as well. one 800 Three five one one two one two, and if you just joined us, talking about the book Darwin's Doubt: The Explosive Origin of Animal Life and the Case for Intelligent Design, and an opportunity to just once again look at the question of origins, ask some fundamental questions, and to learn a lot more about what uh, we are finding out in the scientific endeavor, and how much of that simply challenges the historic view of the neo-Darwinian view of evolution, which is why you've had alternative evolutionary views being put forward simply to try to explain the evidence. We'll continue our conversation with Dr. Stephen Meyer right after these important messages. You are listening to Point of View. For materials offered during the program, please write to Point of View, Post Office Box 30. That's Box 30, Dallas, Texas 75221, zip 75221. Or call our toll-free number 1-800-347-5151. That's 1-800-347-5151. The opinions expressed on Point of View do not necessarily reflect the views of the management or staff of this station. Point of View will continue after this. 708. Now that the second anniversary of independence for South Sudan has come and gone, There is a renewed call by the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom for official statehood following a civil war that lasted 20 years. The U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom states it should have been a time for celebration for millions of Southerners who fought for human rights and religious freedoms. Yet the day stood as a stark reminder that for two years, an estimated 500,000 Southerners in Sudan have been stateless, while living a precarious existence. 
The USCIRF has expressed deep concern that the inability to resolve the status of stateless Southerners who are living in the Islamic North are at risk of undermining their religious freedoms. Talks on statehood have been ongoing since January 2011. John Clemens, IRN, USA, Radio News. You know those commercials that have been on for years and years about Andy Willoughby's three-step plan home business system? You know, the hi, how in the world are you anyway guy? Took me almost 10 years to call. I finally did, just out of curiosity. I was really surprised. This is a business I can make a real income with. And the best part? I don't have to talk my family and friends into doing anything. It's that easy. Call 800-480-2102 or online at 3stepusa.com. You have a mortgage and a load of other debt. Wouldn't it be great if it all just went away? Nine-Year Mortgage can change your life. Hi, I'm Larry Ruff, president of Nine-Year Mortgage. This is unlike anything you've ever seen before, and it will absolutely not harm your credit. Call for your free CD and learn how you can eliminate all of your debt, including your mortgage, much sooner than you ever dreamed possible. The more debt you have, the more we can help. Call now for your free CD, 800-383-5310, 800-383-5310. You are listening to Point of View. The opinions expressed on Point of View do not necessarily reflect the views of the management or staff of this station. And now, here again, is Kirby Anderson. I'd like to join our conversation today as we talk about the subject of origins, 1-800-351-1212. Dr. Stephen Meyer with us as we talk about his book, Darwin's Doubt. And for just a minute, um, maybe as a thought experiment, Stephen, let's, if we can, try to make an organism. But to make an organism, we certainly have to make a gene and some proteins. And it kind of brings me to one of the chapters in which you talk a little bit about Douglas Axe, who was watching uh, how... Uh, an individual we talk about on this program with some regularity, Richard Dawkins, put together a computer simulation so that eventually random letters would create the phrase by Shakespeare, me thinks it is like a weasel. Now, what he did was uh, have these random mutations, if you will, these random letters generating, but then it would always compare the string to the target phrase. Well, of course, um, Douglas Axe figured out very quickly that kind of injects intelligence into the system because you know what your end result is. But nevertheless, I think it's a good illustration of the fact that we're talking about incredibly complex molecules, things that Charles Darwin knew nothing about. And information theory tells us that you just can't string together random letters. You can't string together random genes if we want to take it back into biology, and that can end up with something that actually is a living cell. Well, right. The presence of information is in our experience, and we're talking about the kind of information that we know generally that is communicative or performs a function. So in the book, I contrast a phrase like, me thinks it's like a weasel, or time and tide wait for no man, with just a, a random arrangement of characters. And if you want to generate information that is functional, we know from experience that that kind of information always arises from an intelligent source. One early information theorist who was a pioneer in applying information theory to molecular biology to the digital code stored in DNA said that, um, that information habitually arises from conscious activity. And so when we, recognize, when we realize that the Cambrian explosion is, as I was saying before the, the first break, not just an explosion of form and structure, but an explosion of information, of literally digital code, we have, I think, a powerful indicator of prior intelligent activity. It's the only cause of which we know that's capable of generating huge infusions or explosions of of new functional information. And what Doug Axe did was he looked carefully at uh, first Dawkins' experiment or his simulation and what he, what he showed was that Dawkins was actually simulating the need for intelligence because the computer program that eventually produces me thinks it's like a weasel only did that because of infusions of information that were coming from the programmer. <laughs> First the target phrase and then the information about the, that allowed the comparison of the target phrase to those different strings you were talking about. But then he also tested the idea in the lab and, and discovered that, the, that functional genes and proteins are incredibly rare 
among all the possible ways there are of arranging the genetic characters or the amino acids and proteins. And, and what that means is that if you were to try to search for one of those, those uh, functional proteins among all the possible ways of arranging the, the parts out of which the proteins are made, you'd be searching a long, long time to look for it by random mutation. In fact, far longer than the time available of life on Earth. And, and in, the, in the book, I show that, uh, the, uh, the, the, that even if every event available uh, in the history of life had been searching for a new protein, you'd only search about one ten trillion trillion trillionth of the, of the total possibilities. That's You'd be like a thief looking for the right combination on a bike lock with, say, ten dials and ten billion possible combinations and having only two or three minutes to look before the security guard came around the corner. <laughs> It'd be much more likely than not that the thief would never find that correct combination by trial and error, and that's the situation you're in when you're trying to explain the origin of even a single gene and protein using the, the random mutation natural selection mechanism. You said something else that, uh, again, you're so good uh, with the illustrations. I've heard you speak before, and you bring out Lego blocks and all sorts of things to communicate. But Goofy you, stuff, but, it's, Yeah, it's, it's shameful, really. Yeah, but it's, it's fun, and, of course, your teenage son loves it and all that, and you've got pictures of him in here and all the rest. But it, uh, here's a, you said something about when we see... Um, intelligence, or we see information, we know that there's intelligence. And later on in your book, you have a picture of those giant heads on Easter Island. And if anybody in their mind's eye can imagine those for just a minute, they were these big creatures, that uh, and they're stone creatures that were created. We don't know really who did it, but even though we don't know who was the intelligent uh, designer of those heads, we know that someone did it intelligently, we don't uh, pull up there the first time that we're seeing an Easter Island said, isn't that the most intriguing rock formation I've ever seen before? Or, or if or you've ever go yet. to Mount Rushmore, you even right. if you don't know who Gutzon Morglum is and didn't even know there was a guy that sculpted it, you have a pretty good idea that that level of information demands intelligence. Go ahead. Well, yeah, absolutely. You don't say, gee, isn't it wonderful what wind and erosion did? <laughs> you don't attribute information-rich structures to to material processes. Another good example would be walking into the British Museum, seeing the Rosetta Stone with those lengthy inscriptions carved in the rock in three different languages, and infer that this was a, a strictly material process. Uh, no one says, again, it was wind and erosion. They, they immediately infer, once, once it was recognized that those inscriptions were, were information-bearing, it was, it was immediately assumed that they were the product of an intelligence. And when we see events in the history of life that require great infusions of new information, the same logic applies. And that logic leads us inexorably to the conclusion that there was a designing intelligence responsible for the origin of the first life, or as I argue in this uh, new book, Darwin's Doubt, the origin of animal life, which also required a, an enormous uh, amount of new information. Well, let's talk about that new information, too, because the theory that uh, was put forward by Charles Darwin is their variation, but he didn't know what that was. But as we added genetics, it came to be known as the neo-Darwinian synthesis, and that is mutations give you that new information, and then natural selection works on it. But that's another one of the chapters in your book, and that is we now know a lot more about how deleterious, harmful, whatever word you want to use, are mutations. You've got... Um, some very sad pictures of fruit flies. Anybody that's ever been in a <laughs> biology class, you know, you know, you have the Drosophila fruit flies, and we've subjected these things to uh, chemical mutagens and irradiation. I'm surprised PETA, people for the ethical treatment of animal, aren't upset about all the things we've done to these fruit flies. But anyway, you've got some very horrible looking pictures of fruit flies, but they're all fruit flies. Most of them are really defective fruit flies or dead fruit flies, aren't they? Absolutely, and this 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 is one of the problems that Paul Nelson has uh, exposed in his work, and it's a really powerful argument against the creative power of the, the neo-Darwinian mechanism to build a new body plan, and that's what is on display in the Cambrian: are different ways, unique ways of organizing tissues, organs, and body parts into an integrated architecture, and each of the new Cambrian animal forms. Uh, or many of the new Cambrian animal forms exemplify different body plans. So that's part of the challenge. It's, you've got to build the information to build the proteins, but you also have to arrange the proteins 
into, into cell types and organs and tissues to make new body plans. And Nelson shows, uh, based on work that's been done in, in developmental biology, that that's a real problem, and this is the reason. There are mutations that are sometimes beneficial, but they tend to produce very minor changes in things, like the famed sickle cell anemia mutation that produces a slightly different shape of hemoglobin. Uh, but if you want to build a new body plan, you can't just change things a little bit. You've got to change them a lot. And that means you have, the mutations have to act early in the developmental trajectory of the animal. As the cells are dividing, you've got to catch them early in the first few cell divisions. But mutations that are expressed early in animal development are invariably not just deleterious, not just harmful. They invariably produce what are called embryonic uh, lethals. They produce dead animals. And if you have dead animals, you get no more evolution. So the kind of mutations you need, early acting beneficial mutations that affect the development of a body plan never actually occur. We never get beneficial mutations of that kind. Wow. And so it raises a huge question as to how you would ever build these new body plans that arise in the Cambrian using standard Darwinian mechanisms. You know, uh, one of the other people you quote from in the book is Jonathan Wells, and he's an embryologist who works with you, of course, at the... the uh, a very important discovery institute, but I love, I, it's kind of a humorous phrase. He says, all the evidence points to one conclusion when we're talking about all the things we do to these fruit flies. No matter what we do to a fruit fly embryo, there are only three possible outcomes. A normal fruit fly, a defective fruit fly, or a dead fruit fly. Not even a horse fly, much less you, a horse. Yeah, <laughs> you never really get anywhere with the <laughs> mutations. Uh, small variations, if you're lucky, they might confer a slight survival advantage on it with, with a few molecules, but the fundamental changes in form and structure just do not arise by mutation. All the, all the experimental work has shown that. Well, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, let's take some phone calls. Perhaps you have questions about origins. We're going to carry this in the second hour. Stephen Meyer will have to go, but we'll certainly carry the conversation on about uh, creation, evolution, origins, and if you'd like to join us, 1-800-351-1212. Stay tuned. We'll be back with your calls right after this. Look, kid, never underestimate janitorial products. Paper towels, trash liners, toilet bowl cleaners, mops. These are the things that hold our civilization together. Janitorial products are the foundation of our fragile world. That's why I use Tough Guy products from Granger. They're effective and affordable. They're 20% off in July, so stock up. Get it? Got it? Good. Call, click Granger.com slash Tough Guy or stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. Promotion ends July 31st, 2013. Visit Granger.com forward slash Tough Guy for details. Life is a wild ride, but even that couldn't prepare you for this. You're on your ninth wild ride, the Carnival Twist and Whirl, your granddaughter's wishes trumping your amusement park fears. And it's here, healthy enough to feel the joy over the terror that the question hits you. How did I get here? Was it just hard work or smart choices? Like choosing Rite Aid and exclusive benefits for seniors with Rite Aid's new Wellness 65 Plus program. You get free pharmacist consultations that include medication reviews, blood pressure screenings, and immunization checklists. Wellness 65 Plus also gives you points every prescription, even Medicare, that earn you up to 20% off your Rite Aid purchases fast. All meant to keep you here. Now that you've actually gotten here, here being the best and bravest grandma in the whole wide world. Stop by and enroll free in Wellness 65 Plus at Rite Aid today. With us, it's personal. Certain limitations apply. See your Rite Aid store or riteaid.com for details. If you're the mother of a child with behavior problems, I'd like to talk to you. My name is Janet Lehman. I'm a behavioral therapist and a mom. I know what it's like when the child you love becomes a defiant, out-of-control child who disrespects you. That's why my husband James and I created the Total Transformation, the program that tens of thousands of moms are now using to turn around their child's behavior. If you've heard about the Total Transformation and wondered if it will work for you, now you can try it for free. I'm willing to give away 
try a thousand programs today for free. All you need to do is get the program and let us know how it works for you. We'll let you keep it for free. I know the total transformation works because I use these techniques with my own son and with troubled kids for over 30 years. Let me prove to you that it works by giving you the program for free. Call now. 1-800-382-1708. 1-800-382-1708. That's 1-800-382-1708. Okay, new kid. Here's your company phone. I have pre-programmed it with every number you need in life. The first one's my personal number. Never call it. Ever. The second one is 1-800-GRANGER. Use it for everything else. Any problem you have, they can help. I've also loaded the Granger app for you. You can download it for free, tippy tap on the spot. Your solution is on its way. Granger, get it? Got it? Good. Call, click Granger.com, or stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Now, back to Point of View, your listener supported source for truth. Dr. Stephen Meyer with me for a few more minutes. In the second hour, we'll have kind of an open line on questions about uh, creation, evolution, origins, all sorts of questions you'd like to ask, and we'll do our best to try to respond to those. But while he's still here, let me ask one more question before we take a phone call, and that is you, in one of your later chapters, talk about signs of design in the Cambrian explosion. And even scientists today, uh, for example, you quote from uh, Douglas Irwin and uh, some other people, James Valentine and uh, maybe even Davidson and some of them, are all saying, you know, this theory that we have right now, the so-called neo-Darwinian theory, or even some of the others about uh, uh, ordered complexity or punctuated equilibrium, these just aren't uh, helping us answer this fundamental question about just the origin of all these body parts and all of these creatures. So it seems to me that we might be able to see inference for intelligence even in the fossil record. Your thoughts? Well, certainly those gentlemen you mentioned wouldn't uh, affirm intelligent design, but they are cr- critical of neo-Darwinism. Yes. And um, so many people ask me, how, how do you get from merely critiquing neo-Darwinism and these other more current evolutionary models to turning the corner to making a positive case for design? And the, uh, oddly, my, my um, exploration of that question began with, with uh, studying the origin of species itself, because I began to wonder... Uh, I, you and I met back in the mid '80s, and Charles Saxton was in in Dallas at the time. And I had met Saxton, and he had put forward the, perhaps the first design hypothesis in this new way of framing things. And um, and I left for grad school in the mid '80s, wondering if that could be formulated as a rigorous scientific argument. And in the end, I, ans- I, I, I concluded that it could. And one of the reasons I did was I'd been studying. In, once I got to grad school, I started studying Darwin's own method of scientific reasoning. And he recognized that, or he used a method of reasoning that um, th- that was the different than the kind of reasoning that you use in the laboratory. In the laboratory, you try to repeat things under controlled conditions, and clearly, clearly, you can't do that with the origin of trilobites. You can't make them happen all over again. So, what Darwin used was a more historical method of reasoning, in which he attempted to infer from present effects back to the causes of events in the remote past. And that method of reasoning has a has a name. It's called the method of multiple competing hypotheses or the method of inferring to the best explanation, where the best explanation, according to Darwin, is one that cites a cause which is known from our present experience to produce the effect in question. And when I realized that that's the way he was reasoning, I realized that that method of scientific reasoning applied directly to this crucial question of the origin of biological information, and in particular the information needed to build Cambrian animals, because what we know from experience, again, from our uniform and repeated experience, the basis of all scientific reasoning about the past, is that information only arises from an intelligent source, from conscious and rational activity. And therefore, the case for intelligent design, I think, can be formulated as a rigorous scientific argument, and ironically, a scientific argument that uses the very same method of reasoning that Darwin himself used. And in the, in the Cambrian, you have not only the indicator of intelligence in the information, but there are other indicators as well. I think, for example, the presence of, of digital circuitry, the, the digital circuitry that's necessary to make Cambrian animals develop properly, is another indication uh, indicator of intelligence, as is the, sometimes what's called the top-down pattern of appearance in the fossil record, which is reminiscent of the kind of a pattern that we see in our own history of human technology. So there are lots of indicators of intelligence, but you can get to the inference to intelligence using the same method that Darwin used. 
Very good. Let's take some phone calls, and uh, along the way, we will take your calls. Let's go first to the state of Kentucky. John, you're on with Dr. Stephen Meyer. Thank you for calling today. Uh, how do you explain for uh, mutations in bacteria? I know that, you know, bacteria emerges. We have antibiotics that take care of that. They, they develop a resistance to it. And they always talk about the bacteria genetically mutating to become stronger. How do we explain for that? And I'll get off the phone and... and uh, <clears throat> Yeah, that's a great question. Um, There's a good discussion of that in the book Explore Evolution, and you can find that uh, online. I think there's a website for exploreevolution.com, and you can get it through Discovery Institute as well. Um, The the antibiotic resistance occurs because of it's a kind of a lesser of two evils sort of option for the organism. Certain uh, critical functions of the organism are being damaged even as the acquisition of, of antibiotic resistance is acquired. And so the, um, that is a, a pro, it's a genuine um, improvement for the bacterium in certain kind of stressful uh, situations, in particular in the, in the stressful, stressful situation in which an antibiotic is, agent is present. Uh, remove that agent, and those bacteria will not compete as well as the, the ones that have not acquired that resistance. And you can kind of see that this type of a process of mutation has a limited shelf life or a limited upside because if you're, if you have to damage something that's mission critical in order to get that antibiotic resistance, eventually you're going to uh, reach a point of diminishing return. So you can't extrapolate from the process that produces that kind of um, resistance to uh, uh, the production of something fundamentally new, some new innovation. It's, it's going the wrong direction overall. And uh, so it's a real process, but it's very much a limited kind of, um, uh, li- there's limited upside to, that, to the type of processes that produce that, that uh, uh, resistance to antibiotics. You know, John, one of the things I might encourage you to do, matter of fact, if you want to write back um, or even send an email, I'll send you a free copy of my book, A Biblical Point of View on Intelligent Design, because I've got a quote uh, from a leading evolutionist, Pierre Paul Grasset, and in his book on the evolution of living things, said, what is the use of their unceasing mutations? Because he's talking about, in this case, the mutations of bacteria and viruses. And he says these are, the mutations of bacteria and viruses, merely hereditary fluctuations around a median position, a swing to the right, a swing to the left, but no final evolutionary effect. And so, yes, you see modification, maybe a little bit of horizontal change, but you don't see the vertical change. Or back to the point that you made a few minutes ago, Stephen, we were talking about uh, survival rather than arrival. So certainly natural selection will allow a a bacteria to have some slight changes, uh, but even there, even though he's a firm evolutionist, he's admitting, you know, we see a swing to the left, a swing to the right, but we see no final evolutionary change. Yeah, and, and no new innovation, no new structural innovation. You're actually degrading the, the cell wall and the, the, uh, the mechanisms for protein synthesis as you acquire that acquisition. So um, it's, it, you can't extrapolate from a mechanism which is degrading mission-critical systems to uh, explain the, the origin of completely new systems. It's, it's going the wrong direction. Well, just before we let you go, I wanted you to talk about what you have there at the Discovery Institute. I've been a supporter for many years. I have most all of the books and videos and other resources. There's even an opportunity for people to be educated online. Uh, talk about what is available there at the Discovery Institute. Well, absolutely. And uh, we, we have lots of other books like the book we've been talking about that are written at a level that are accessible to a popular audience. Uh, I wrote Darwin's Doubt is a scientific mystery story and try to explain the science as we go. We've got more technical works. We have uh, textbooks and many videos now, 10 or uh, 12 science documentaries. We have a worldview curriculum. Uh, this this uh, issue of origins is obviously very important. To um, It has big worldview implications, however you answer the question, whether in a Darwinian way or in a way that affirms that there's design in the universe. Uh, and so... Uh, it's, I think these are great resources for people of faith in particular because people of faith are aware that their uh, um, a biblical point of view entails a worldview. And uh, while intelligent design doesn't prove uh, the existence of God or the God of the Bible, it does affirm a key tenet of a biblical worldview, namely that there is design evident in the natural world and it's not the product of an undirected material process. And, and uh, so um, uh, if you go to discovery.org or... Uh, 
darwinsdoubt.com. I think those are good portholes into some of this information. Well, Dr. Stephen Meyer, always great to have you on the program. Thank you for an excellent book, and thank you for giving us an hour today here on Point of View. Thank you for your time, Kirby. I appreciate it very much.